Centers for Disease Control. You can see that in this most recent outbreak of severe respiratory disease, thousands of children had to go to the hospital and some of them were so ill that they died. Children with asthma were particularly affected. They had difficulty breathing, rapid respirations, little or no fever, and were so ill that their usual asthma medications couldn't control the wheezing. Sometimes, the children who got sick were previously well. Ethan was one such child. He's an eight-month-old boy who had a mild runny nose and woke up in the middle of the night crying and breathing fast. His mother said that she could see his ribs every time he took a breath, and he looked blue around his lips. He had been fine when he went to bed. She called 911, and the EMTs found that he had a very low oxygen saturation in his blood and was struggling to breathe. They gave him supplemental oxygen and immediately took him to the hospital. He recovered there in the next two days and then went home happy, healthy, and smiling. No worse for the wear. So let's talk a little bit more about the epidemiology of this virus. Human beings are the only known reservoir for enterovirus. There are multiple serotypes, and most diseases are caused by a limited number of serotypes. Enterovirus causes both endemic and epidemic infections, and most cases, as shown in the graph on the slide, occur in the summer and fall. Enterovirus is the most common cause of viral meningitis in the United States. This is a list of the clinical syndromes we see with enteroviral infections. These syndromes reflect the pathogenesis of enteroviral infection, mainly as a result of the viremia that occurs. As you can see, asymptomatic infection is the most common outcome we see with enteroviral infection. In addition, patients often develop fever, sometimes associated with headache, or upper respiratory tract symptoms like a runny nose. We call this a summer cold. I'm going to spend some more time talking about some of the other more characteristic or severe manifestations of disease in the next few slides. The manifestations that I'm going to talk about will make more sense if you keep the pathogenesis of infection in mind. This is outlined here on the slide. Remember that there's a primary as well as a secondary viremia, and disease occurs after the secondary viremia with infection of target organs. So these two pictures show common upper respiratory tract syndromes. Patients may develop erythematous papules on the outside of their mouth or shallow ulcers in the oral pharynx associated with erythema. These findings may occur alone or with other skin rashes. If the patient just has ulcers in the oral pharynx, the syndrome is called herpangina. This disease is a result of the local replication of the virus in the oral pharynx. If the sores in the mouth are accompanied by a rash on the hands and feet, this is called hand, foot, and mouth disease. The rash on the feet is usually red and raised or papules. There may be some vesicles or blisters, and pustules may also be present. The rash is often painful. This is usually a childhood illness, but it can occur in adults. Different serotypes of enterovirus cause this disease, and the skin manifestations are a result of a secondary viremia and infection of other tissues. Remember that during viremia associated with enteroviral infection, muscle cells can become infected. Both striated muscle and cardiac muscles are affected. Patients may present with muscles that are sore to the touch and may have difficulty walking because of pain. If the heart muscle is affected, as shown in the histology slide, the infection and subsequent inflammation can ca cause cardiac muscle dysfunction and ultimately cardiac failure. The x-ray shows an enlarged heart, a finding suggestive of congestive heart failure. Patients may need a heart transplant if the infection and inflammation are severe and prolonged. Patients may also develop meningitis and encephalitis due to enterovirus. Remember, this virus is the most common cause of viral meningitis in the United States. Patients present with signs and symptoms of meningitis, specifically fever, headache, stiff neck or meningismus, photophobia or light hurting the eyes, and emesis. They may have a diffuse rash or other findings like cough, runny nose, or oral ulcers that are suggestive of enteroviral infection. Like all enteroviral infections, there is both endemic and epidemic disease with a summer to fall seasonality. Infants who are less than three months of age have the highest rate of viral meningitis. Sometimes a specific serotype of enterovirus can cause very severe disease. For instance, enterovirus 
A71 has been linked with a rhomboencephalitis or inflammation of the brain stem in outbreaks of hand, foot, and mouth disease in the Eastern Hemisphere, primarily in Taiwan, Japan, Malaysia, and Australia. Fatality rates from these um, outbreaks has been as high as 14%. Myoclonus and, or uncontrolled rhythmic movement is a poor prognostic indicator as are lethargy, persistent fever, and high fever. We're now gonna talk about polio virus, which is also an enterovirus. Polio is now largely eradicated worldwide because of vaccines. However, it continues to cause significant morbidity in patients who have had polio in the past, like this gentleman who has atrophic and weak muscles due to prior nerve damage from polio. So like other enteroviruses, polio can invade nerve cells during viremia. We know that it infects specific parts of the nervous system in the spinal cord called the dorsal root ganglia. This is a junction of many motor neurons and infection results in unilateral weakness of a limb, with limb, the legs being the most commonly affected limb. In addition, it can affect the motor nerves of the diaphragm resulting in respiratory failure. This infection damages the nerve cells and can cause permanent disability. The polio syndrome occurs in approximately 1% of patients infected with the virus. Like other enteroviruses, most infections with polio virus are either asymptomatic or result in fever or an upper respiratory tract infection. So how do we make the diagnosis of enterovirus? For most patients, we do not do any tests. The diagnosis is based on signs and symptoms alone. If the patient has meningitis, encephalitis, or polio-like syndrome, obtaining a CSF for diagnostic studies is critical. If the patient has other severe systemic illnesses like myocarditis, obtaining blood and tissue to make the diagnosis is key. PCR is the diagnostic test we usually perform. It targets conserved portions of the viral genome. It is more sensitive than viral culture if performed on the CSF, so it's the diagnostic test of choice in that instance. Since there is overlap between the genomes of rhinovirus and enterovirus, there may be cross-reactivity for some PCR tests, so keep this in mind. Sometimes, when a diagnosis isn't clear or we need more specific information, we do culture uh, of the stool or oropharynx. This allows determination of specific, ser specific serotypes. The caveat is that enterovirus is shed for a long time in the stool, so interpret a positive result with caution. There's no treatment for enteroviral infections. We provide supportive care, primarily pain and fever control, and encourage fluids so patients do not become dehydrated. Most of the time, symptoms resolve within a week and healthy patients recover completely. It isn't clear if IBIG actually helps antibody deficient patients, but it is sometimes given. If the patient is hospitalized, we use special contact precautions to prevent the spread of disease. Because of the way enteroviruses spread, hygienic measures are the cornerstone of prevention. Clean water, good hand washing, and prevention of respiratory droplet transmission by covering your mouth when you cough is critical. We do have an effective vaccine for polio, but not other enteroviruses. So polio has been largely eradicated worldwide. This chart shows the number of cases in the thousands in the United States from 1950 to the end of the 20th century. You can see there was a dramatic decline in once the vaccine was introduced in the 1950s. There are two different types of polio vaccines that we use worldwide. This photo shows one of the polio vaccines that is given in many parts of the world today, the oral polio vaccine, which is live and attenuated. In the United States, patients are given the inactivated polio vaccine, which is an injection. This table compares and contrasts the two different types of vaccines. Both include combinations of attenuated variants of three serotypes of polio virus that can cause disease. You can see that the development of immunity is faster for the oral vaccine, which is live and attenuated. An additional benefit of this vaccine is that there's secondary immunization within a community because of excretion of the vaccine strains of the polio virus in the stool. The major problem with the live attenuated vaccine uh, for healthy patients is that there are rare reversions of the vaccine strain to wild type polio virus, which can cause disease in approximately four per 10 million vaccine doses. You cannot give the live attenuated vaccine to immunocompromised patients because they will become ill with this. 
In summary, like many other viruses, uh, asymptomatic infection is the most common manifestation of enteroviral infection. But severe illnesses like central nervous system infection or cardiac muscle infection can occur. The diagnosis is usually clinical, except in severe cases, where PCR is the diagnostic, diagnostic test of choice. Prevention is through ensuring clean water and good hygiene. Polio, which is a type of enterovirus, um, can be prevented by immunization, and there are two effective vaccine types.